Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am joined today by my good friend, Ashley Drew Jones, and let's get right to it. I mean, uh, in, in full honesty, you and I, <laughs> we barely made this call. Like I, I was f five minutes beforehand. This was scheduled a week ago, and so much has happened in that week. And I commend you for actually doing this because I'm tired and, um, and I can only imagine what you've been through, certainly in the past 24 hours. Um, so yeah, I just want to turn it over to you and I just really want to listen. I'll, I'll try to ask questions, but, but I think overall, just to set the table, I realize most of my audience is white and, um, I want to do something about that. And so I think we need to listen and, um, I want to listen. So yeah. go ahead. I think, um, this has been a fight that I've been aware of obviously my entire life. Um, being a, uh, black American, you see, I can't even remember the first racist thing I experienced. Um, but I can think of like the earliest one I can recall is being like four. Um, so it's not, it's not something that this is, it's, this isn't new. I think for me personally, um, I've always been very active in the community. I've always been, whether it's been campaigning for politicians or whatever, I've always been, um, very active in the community. Um, both my parents are respectfully very active for a lot of different um, organizations and they both married people who are also very active in a lot of organizations. So activism is something that's always been very familiar. I think this time around, especially within the last 24 hours, um, something that already felt very personal to me uh, became a little bit more real. I feel like every time this um, we go through the cycle with pre police brutality where we see a video, then we see another video, and then for whatever reason, the third or fourth video strikes and it hits a new nerve, and this, this need to fight comes, and, and we come together like this, and we protest, and we, we discuss, and all these things, and then it dies down, and then the cycle repeats. For me, um, most people that know uh, who follow my social media accounts, my brother was actually attacked by the police yesterday. Um, unlawfully was, uh, his window was busted in. Um, he was maced and tased and dragged out of his car um, and arrested and no one knew who he was for hours on end. Um, for me, that was, I didn't think I could feel anger more than I was already feeling it. And to, Yesterday for me was a the 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 snap. It was the I already was empathetic with how hectic things had gotten because I thought to myself, if that was me, if that was my family, if that was something that I loved that, that happened to, I would burn it down. And then to see how close that was to happening to, to knowing that my brother was a moment away from being a hashtag to knowing that the carefree black boy that I've grown up with and loved to know that that person isn't there anymore because this innocence has been stolen from him made me realize exactly how serious I was about burning <laughs> this shit down. I, I think I, I had to turn off everything yesterday because the anger that I felt felt unnatural. Uh, rightfully so. I mean, uh, you know, just to offer a different perspective along those same lines, um, you know, I had called the police department um, today and uh, I, I was asking, you don't even know their names and, and their badges, correct? Right. We, they are not on the police report, which is a requirement. And that's so, and, and, and this is, and I, 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 I encourage people to A, really do this because A, it matters, but B, you start to realize the undercurrent. I called and, they'll, and I said, I, I, I need to find out the names. And the woman said, well, they should be on the police report. Well, I'm like, well, they're not. So what are the steps that I can take? They're like, well, you can go to court, but you would need their names. I'm like, I'm not trying to be upset here. I'm trying to find a solution. Please do not make me get upset. Like, do you see how you're offering a dead end? Uh, those are my dogs. I apologize. Uh, 
On the plus side, now whenever they bark at the window, there's a Black Lives Matter sign, so I feel like they're doing their part. They're adding on. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it, it, it's just mind-boggling in these different ways, and um, you know, I'll, there, there's a lot I want to kind of unpack and ask you, but just to kind of also another thing. So there, there was a LA. LA Zoom meeting, virtual Zoom meeting, to see what we can do about reform. Only 500 people could get in on the Zoom meeting. Yeah. Members of the press couldn't get on and, and various things. And for 45 minutes, they're just talking about, hey, can we increase the capacity? How do we solve this? And there's no place for me to comment. I had called, you know, I looked up the commissioner's names that were part of this and the police chief, and I looked up that number. It's only a police number. So I called the police and I said, hey, there's a Zoom meeting going on right now. I feel like I have at least a couple of options for you to try. Like, I want to, I want to help so people can actually be part of this. They're like, well, we don't know how to. I was like, what the? Like, does nobody know how to do anything? You yeah. Know? Like, I want to be part of the solution. And it's just mind boggling. And um, so I, I know you kind of know that. I want to take a quick step back, if you don't mind. You said you experienced racism at the age of four. Can mm -hmm. I ask you, because people always say racism is learned. When was the, what, was, what, what was the youngest age you experienced racism from? Is that, you, you know what I mean? Like, like the, the kid doing it to you. How old, how, how young was someone at the youngest age? Um, I think, I'm trying to remember. I think the... And it's so silly because I don't, I, I want to preface this by, it wasn't a malicious thing, but it could easily turn into, if it was nurtured, it would turn into a malicious thing. Because that's a whole own thing where I don't believe all racism is malicious, but it's equally as harmful. Um, but I actually have um, my, my stepsister, my niece, um, my stepsister, she was maybe like three, and she said... She said, Anna Ash, she goes, you have icky brown skin. Mm -hmm. And she's a little white girl. She said, you have icky brown skin. Why, why do you have icky brown skin? And we have white skin. And I looked at my stepsister kind of waiting for her to jump in on it, and she didn't. And it was an opportunity for me to kind of talk. And I knew that my little niece didn't mean it mean. You know what I'm saying? But that, that idea of my skin being icky and hers not, and I mean, this was a family member. Yeah. Well, yeah. the earliest, the earliest racism I can remember towards me is family. Mm -hmm. um, if people don't know, I'm biracial. Um, but when I was little, the earliest thing I can remember is my mom remarried my stepdad, who I'm extremely close with. I consider him my dad. Um, you know, I grew up with him. Um, but I remember meeting his side of the family when he and my mom started dating and I was like three or four and I remember the reaction because I don't think that they told his family because my mom's white but I don't think that they told his family that I was black mm -hmm. and I remember feeling the the disdain when I walked in and met my now grandmother and my aunts and uncles and I remember being little and feeling it wasn't like they were calling me the n-word or anything like that but I remember the blatant difference between how I was treated and how my cousins and how my later in life, my siblings who came around, how they were treated in comparison to me. And I remember from the jump feeling like I didn't belong and I wasn't welcome, which is crazy because you're four. And understanding at four that it was because strictly of how you looked and being, and you're four, what, what it, how do you dislike a four-year-old? I don't know. And, it, and it's so crazy. Like, you know, I, I, like, thank God I have, I really pride myself on the ability to listen because I really feel, you know, um, everyone hides behind the fact of like, oh, well, I'm not a racist. And I've, I've tried to stop saying that because I feel like, listen, it, it's painful. Like, I don't admit, it's not like a proud badge I wear. Like, I am a racist. Um, Certainly, if nothing else, I have racist tendencies, and I, I I can look back at my own history in that way of like, yeah, and 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 and, but but I will say the good news, like I I pride myself on the ability to listen because Melody Hobson, I I listened to her, she really taught me like, don't say I'm colorblind, 
Because that's an instance where if, if truly you didn't see color, that wouldn't have mattered. Right. But it did matter. And, and so don't say you're colorblind because you're not, you know, and I'm not obviously saying, I'm not saying you. Um, so yeah, and, and, and I think, you know, and the reason I asked you that question, because a lot of people kind of, I've, I've seen a lot of things of like, you know, wh what, was, what was the age at which you as a white person had a black professor? And it's astounding to see that most people's answers is it's college. Mine was college. Even that is one. It's not like, oh, all of a sudden I have a black, you know, curriculum. Just one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was talking with, luckily, I, I had a wonderful professor named Rob Patton Sproul, and to this day, he remains a mentor. And, you know, he, he is someone that, a huge advocate. He did an amazing documentary with uh, Public Enemy, and I, I um, you know, I'm forever grateful for him teaching me all the things. But he pointed out, like, we, we received from, from my alma mater, Emerson College, um, our president is black. But Rob also pointed out, now, how many black tenured uh, uh, professors are there? Zero. I was like, shit, you're right. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a question of where to go. We can talk, you know, I, you can pick the direction. I just yeah. want to express that. I think that's something I've been thinking about and processing a lot um, in recent months is the concept of racism is, the all racism is big, bad, calling you the N-word. Um, burning down churches, that type of like malicious, in your face racism. I'm from the South and I always joke with um, my roommate Nakia that I kind of miss Southern racism because at least in that aspect, it's right in your face and you know exactly what you're walking into. Yeah. Living in Los Angeles, I've learned more than ever that Sometimes the most dangerous people are the ones who know all the right lingo to say. Um, and, and sometimes the, the most dangerous acts of racism aren't intentional. Um, I, I think it harms, it harms the cause by um, separating um, the two. And I think, I think being scared to call something racist. People are so scared of being called racist that they don't acknowledge that things are racist. Yeah. And they don't acknowledge their own behavior. And there's even things, I'm a light-skinned black woman, and to people who aren't in the black community and don't understand colorism, you've probably seen a lot more people who look like me on TV than you have, say, of a Gabrielle Union or a Lupita. There's a lot more light-skinned African actresses that look like me than there are that look like them and there's a reason to that and I know that during all of this I've really had to reflect on how I benefit from the oppression and racism that's happening in America as a light-skinned woman because I and a lot of people's perception am deemed a more tolerable version of a black woman because I have more Eurocentric features or because I have lighter skin, because I have more likeness to whiteness, I get treated differently. And I think I'm saying that because it takes all of us sitting there, looking in the mirror and seeing how do I play a part in all of this? Where have I benefited from it? Have I, have I made the mistake of using it to my advantage? And if so, Rather than beating myself up about it and drowning in this guilt, how can I use that privilege to make it a safer space for the people who this privilege has been used against? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting. So I, I know a girl and you know, she's a, she's a therapist. And one of the things that she's trying to, she, she went, I, I don't know what the organization is, but it's like, you know, the national organization for therapists not the title, but just, you know, on the premise of it. And, you know, it's just even on that level, like therapists aren't talking about, like they're never working through someone's racism. And she's like, listen, if we want to help heal people's mind, this needs to be part of it. And, you know, cause it's like, yeah, you don't just get to turn a blind eye in that sense. Like it's, it's, it's not. And, you know, um, I don't know if you know Ebony K. Williams. She's a, she's a friend of mine and um, I, I always look up to her. And she was on um, Maria Menounos' show, Better Together. And I say that so everyone can check it out. Um, but she talked about this is a white 
people problem and you have to do the homework. And I'm, I'm curious to know your thoughts on that because I am someone who agrees like this is, you know, uh, I, I've seen so much lip service from people of like, oh my gosh, this is so horrible. This should never be allowed to happen. And I've said this before, um, but I'll say it again in case, you know, cause I doubt people have heard me say it enough times, but you know, I, I am someone of that's kind of done that in the past. And, you know, if I'm being honest, it's one of those things like I want other people to have a better life, but, it, but down to brass tacks, it was really about like, I wanted normalcy in my life again. So I could, you know, work on my scripts, you know, just do whatever. Right. And, and I think it's one of those things like, that's something that we, as white people, we have to sit with. And it's like, this, this is no law. You have to go beyond yourself of like, you know, I, I, there's a couple of people that I've seen. I've had to call them out. They're like, oh my God, the looting and so forth is bad. And I'm like, I'm not necessarily condoning it, but like, look at the root cause. So just because you want to get back to normal day life, guess what? They want a normal life, which they've never had. Mm. Um, so again, not necessarily a question there, but can you sort of talk like the, what, you know, the white homework, if you will. Yeah. Um, first off, is this really loud? No, no, uh, I don't think so. Um, I, in the, in the fall, in the past like week or so, I have received white guilt text like up the wazoo. Like if I had a, if I had a dollar or a vote for every time someone sent me a text with their white guilt, shit might actually change. No. Um, I think we don't want your white guilt. We want you to do the homework. I am exhausted. I, I grew up in a world, and just like every other black person, I'm not special, but black people grew up going to school and learning everyone's history but our own. I can tell you about the Holocaust. I can tell you about the Asian internet camps um, that they had going on. I can tell you about... Um, Discrim discrimination towards the Irish. I can tell you about discrimination towards the Italians. I, I know other people's history. I grew up in schools that never taught mine beyond MLK, beyond Thurgood Marshall. And even with those educate, like even with those lessons, they were edited and they were filtered to make you think that things were done when black people just were good people. And it wasn't until I, I got older and I, I became an African-American uh, studies major, and I started doing the history and learning about just the absolute horrors of what this country has put us through and the things that we've had to do just to get basic rights. Um, I, I've, told, I've told a few people this before, but I remember growing up and um, going to visit my grandparents, and I used to trace these scars down my grandfather's arm. And I remember finally getting a little bit older and asking him finally where they came from. And it was from being beaten by the police for just a sit-in, for doing exactly what I'm doing now, back then. Right. Um, so it's like, I don't, we don't need your, we don't need your guilt. I need you to take, I need you to take that guilt and I need you to take it to your friends. I need you to take it to your family. I need you to understand that like you might you lose relationships, you might lose friendships, but we're losing them on a whole nother level. I mean, you're like, losing you life. Lose, yeah. You might lose relationships and friendships because you all disagree. I'm losing relationships and friendships because my friends and my family and people who look like me are being buried six feet under. Like it, it's a, it's a different it's a different scenario, and we're in such a blessed time where all of this information is at the tip of our fingertips. I have a friend, and I know you know her too, um, Ali Nasta, who is a she's an amazing host and um, writer and everything. And she, I one of the best texts I received this week was from her because she said, "I'm sorry, I love you." These are the things I'm doing to educate myself. And if there's more that I can personally do for you as a person, let me know. And, and I thought that, that was such a beautiful text to get because it wasn't requiring me to do any more emotional labor. 
because the black people in your life right now are using all of their energy to keep sane and to stay alive and, and to try to find an inkling of hope during all of this. Um, in an effort uh, to, to really kind of clarify it, what do you think is the difference of sincerity versus insincerity? Because I go back and forth and I, you know, I don't know what to necessarily text. And, you know, I am someone that is like Ali Nasta in the sense that I want to offer that up and I want to offer up solutions, but I would never want, I, I don't want it to come off as lip service of like, oh, hey, Drew, you know, so sorry. By the way, here's what I'm doing. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And I know that she's not saying it in that way, but, but I just never want it to be conceived of like, oh, hey, by the way, like, look at me. I'm now good because I'm doing X, Y, and Z. So right. what's the fine line? I think for me, um, in politics, before you vote for someone, you always look at their track record, right? So um, you always see what they, they're saying all the right things, but I always look at their track record to see if they actually follow through with these things. Mm -hmm. When you are offering your, whatever you're offering to your black friend, let them see that, like you don't, I don't want you texting them like a post where you are arguing with a racist, but I think like for me in the, in the case of like Allie, I knew what she was saying was sincere because she, she sent me that, but then I visual, like I could see her learning, whether it was her educating someone else or whether it was her offering resources to other people, I saw her do the work. And it wasn't, and it's not necessarily that I needed to see her do, like needed it to believe it or whatever. Like, it's not like it was a performative thing where I like, she texted it to me and then I instantly went and looked and yeah. double checked. It was just one of those things where it was like, she texted it to me, I put it in my pocket, thank you. And then as I was going through and, and strengthening my own education and, and working on myself, I was able to actually pull a resource from her. Mm -hmm. awesome. And I think that's the difference is we can tell when it's performative and we can tell when it's not because your actions will always line up. Yeah, absolutely. The Lord show. Um, one of the things that I have learned um, and and sort of grappling with um, is 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 the fact like uh, whenever you protest, this should not be about Trump ultimately. And right. That's not excusing him by any stretch of the imagination, but it diminishes d diminishes racism because it's it's not a new concept under trump um right. can you speak to that a little bit more because i know you have very similar feelings in terms of trump so how do you kind of you know extract the two or separate the two absolutely trump is the face for now of racism racism has many masks it has many faces and for now Trump is now. Now, do I believe that Trump um, has held a, a microphone up to the voice of what America really is? Absolutely. Do I think he's put a microscope and shown us all exactly how much we haven't progressed? Absolutely. But these things haven't exist, or these things have been existing the entire time. Um, I, the president, we we live in a democracy. The president has power, but that power only goes so far. So before we tear down simply the president and strictly say that this is a Trump issue, review how the politicians in your state, in your city, in your district are handling this. A very great example of this is how Eric Garcetti, the mayor of Los Angeles, is handling the protest right now. In response to the protest turning violent, Eric Garcetti decided that he was going to shut down COVID testing centers as a punishment for cars being for police officer cars being set on fire which is quite is one of itself because i've seen it, pictures like we live in like, like the joke being we live in hollywood we know what a picture car is yeah i also was visibly i was physically there when those things happened and can tell you from the bottom of my heart that that car was planted with the intention of escalating a situation but even if we're not even if we take that away the response to racism the response to Black people and their allies crying out and saying enough is enough, you decided that because they risked their lives by exposing themselves possibly to COVID to fight 
this nationwide issue, you decided to punish those people by taking away testing centers to them. That in itself is a disgusting racist act. Michael Moore, who's the chief of police for Los, An for Los Angeles, not today, to be confused uh, with the other Michael Moore, the documentarian. Two correct. <laughs> correct. You probably saw him go um, uh, be a trending hashtag on Twitter because he came out and said that the looters were equally as responsible for the death of George Floyd as the police officers. Yeah, not the time to say it. You don't say that. It's not, but that's... We, the people, have control of who puts chief of police in position. Mayor Garcetti has protected chief of police Michael Moore for years. Under Michael Moore, there have been multiple, I'm talking like dozens upon dozens, of unexplained black and brown deaths at the hands of the police that have never been brought to justice because of Michael Moore's racist tactics. And Mayor Garcetti has backed him up the entire time. It's easy to take it to Trump because he's the loudest, but it doesn't mean he's the most dangerous. No. And what's crazy is this isn't a Republican versus Democratic thing because I've, any black person can tell you that both parties are not here for us. This two-party system is a two-party system that's still built on the backs of black lives. So it's not a us versus them. It's not a liberal versus conservative. It's not a, it, it, it's, it's a whole system that's completely messed up and completely built on the impression of black people. And so the, the vote for your state representative to the vote for your mayor, to the vote of your senator and governor, and yes, president, those are all equally as important. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you, uh, there's a couple of, I want to start to get solution oriented, but, and be slash like hopeful. Um, I don't know how well you've been tracking the international side of this because, you know, you know, I'm not trying to correct you. I'm, in fact, I'm trying to like help. The, like I've seen, I'm very encouraged that this is an international movement. Um, just a small example, like uh, trains in Belgium have Black Lives Matter and it's not graffitied. It is, it is deliberate by the, you know, the country or the train organization, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Berlin, outside the U.S. Embassy, people are protesting. London, and gentrified areas are protesting. Toronto, and and it's only buildings. So, yeah, it, 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 you know, I, it, it is not a Republican, Democrat. This this is a this is international, and um, but you can speak to that. But but also in lieu, you know to talk about the solutions, um, the big thing of defunding police. I want to kind of talk about that, and um, I want to pose what I know, and then you know, perhaps you can correct me slash add on to it. Um, A, the, the, the police departments in, across the country are heavily overfunded comparatively to libraries, uh, health services, transportation. And the argument being that defunding the police will actually escalate the, the elevate the community. Um, and part of it, I was listening to um, Pod Save America and um, I forget the person's name i just had so much information so i apologize but the latest pod save america episode they had a guest and he was talking about behavioral and action change so putting he was talking about like putting body cams has not deterred the police violence so you have to do both uh behavioral and action um he was talking about how having uh, the threshold is like over 34 percent if you have over 34 percent of of the police station be at least black that lowers it. Um, he was talking about, I'm trying to think, um, uh, I, I just, uh, shoot, there was a very important one. Oh, one of the big things that he was talking about is most of the 911 calls that people get is the equivalent of, you know, a house dispute, a cat in a tree. You don't need uh, weapons for that, and hence the argument. So, um, is, you know, am I incorrect in any of that? Um, cause I'm, I'm learning it and you know, what else do you want to sort of add to, to by all means? Um, I totally agree with all of that. Uh, the problem with our police system, especially right now is it's overly funded and the training is there's not enough education and training. I am from a family, a long line of police officers. I have multiple police officers in my family. Um, I love them dearly. I also can recognize though that the training that is was necessary for when they became police officers is not extensive enough for someone that I would feel comfortable having 
the access to all of the military equipment that the average police officer has. Question, do they get recertified? Because my mom's a nurse and they're constantly being recertified. No, and that's the problem that the qualifications to become a police officer vary by county, they vary by state. Um, there's no clear um, requirements for all police officers. Mm -hmm. uh, when one of my uncles was becoming a police officer, it was a six week course. With another one, an associate's degree was required. This was in the span of maybe five years. So the qualifications for what it takes to be a police officer now, and I have a friend who's actually going through the process now, and now it requires, for Louisville at least, which is where I'm from, it requires a full on degree. So the requirements have changed over the years, but say my uncles no longer require certain certifications that now my friend who's becoming a police officer now requires. So you have people from, who have been in the force for 10, 15, 20 years who all they had to do was graduate high school with no psych, back, you know, no psych background check and no real training who are walking the streets alongside people who you know, have had to maybe do jump through a little bit of like more hoops, but that is strictly from county to county difference. And, and, and feasibly, one could argue, right, that, that the people with the lesser training because it's from years past, they're in higher positions in the police force, correct? Right. Okay. Um, and with that being said, the, the equipment and um, policies and everything vary from city to city and um, county to county. You know, um, Breonna Taylor, the woman who was shot in Louisville, that is my hometown. And the reason that they were able, the police officers came in not wearing uniforms, not announcing who they were, in a state where we have the right to stand our ground. So they come in, don't announce that they're police, don't have to knock on the door and say that they're police and automatically are met with bullets, which is a natural response to anyone in the state of at least Kentucky. If you come into my house, I'm allowed to have a gun to protect myself and stand my ground. If you break into my house at 3 a.m., most people are going to respond with bullets. No. Brianna Taylor was shot eight times in her sleep because of a policy that Louisville had. Now, that policy isn't existing here. Do you see what I mean? Like, it, there's no, there's not a straight laced like, this is the standard, this is what's allowed. It varies from county to county, and that's, that is, that's intentional because it sets people up for failure to not know their rights. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, whether it's the NAACP or whatever, I think I, I'm seeing pretty clear cut uh, demands. And so that's part of it. Correct. Just have a very specific demands. Don't let them change and, and, and spreading it. So that way it's consistent across, uh, you know, county and so forth. Right. Uh, and what is, um, you know, I guess in that policy reform, what is the best way, like apart from voting, you know, cause I think a lot of people, tell, you know, go out and vote. And I think, Absolutely. I'm not, you know, like if anything, I'm not discouraging it. I'm encouraging it. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's like, that's not enough at this point. Like what else, what else can we, um, you know, add to the effort? I think um, it's really easy to bandwagon off of the most popular person in your party. And I think it's also very easy to stick within your party. You know, um, I think now more than ever, it's less about going for what's popular and what seems cool and really reading and learning people's track records and really getting behind those people. I mean, Bernie Sanders is a perfect example of someone who was somewhat the underdog in an election. And because people, because this generation now more than ever decided to maybe not go behind the normal pick, which would be like a Hillary Clinton, they decided to actually look at the track records and actually compare the two and actually see who was about, really about that life. Bernie ended up getting a lot closer than he say would have if we just went ahead and went with who made, like who right off the bat seemed to make the most sense. 
Mm. You know, like I, I encourage people to actually read people's track records. I encourage people to look into what, like what your, um, your, your party is funding. I encourage people to not just go off of the excitement of the, the idea of a first female president or the idea of a first, um, you know, person of color president or, and I'm not, and I don't get me wrong, I love Barack Obama, but I'm saying like, I encourage people to go beyond just like, how cool would it be if this happened? And I really look at people's track records, really do the work to look at the organizations that are funding these people, look into the, and seeing how you can help them. Like, because when you vote these people in, you're not just voting them in, you're voting in all of these organizations that have back them yeah so it's like pay attention to what people say but pay more attention to what they do yeah no i i 100 percent agree and and in fact like uh yeah i've seen i've seen the uh, pyramid of racism float around so many times at this point and um you know i actually knew about it thankfully through um uh, she, I always know her name, uh, Robin D'Angelo. She wrote a book called White Fragility. So I actually was introduced it about a year ago and I'm so thankful that I was, but now I'm seeing it. I'm grateful, but like, yeah, the, the, the idea of like just voting and blindly is a form of racism. And so I'm glad that, you know, you really brought that up. Um, uh, I, I mean, I can't even say that I've covered everything that I wanted to say because I had no agenda. Um, but is there anything that you feel is important to share? in this time it could be it could even be personal it could be something else you know whatever, whatever you want to say um i think that something that i think is really important to me at least is um the idea that it shouldn't just be upsetting that people who are george floyd everything that's been said about george floyd is what a man of the community the community he was what a good person he was and all those things. And that's great. I love that. What if George Floyd was an asshole to people, if he cut people off on the highway, if people didn't have a nice thing to say about him, he still didn't deserve to die. And I think that's really important that we don't let these, I don't, someone's character doesn't need to be great for me to know that they don't deserve to die mm -hmm. at the hands of the police. Yeah. And I think we need to, we need to um, also support these stories that don't fit our narrative. Um, there are black trans women are dying at a rate, an alarming rate due to racism, transphobia, homophobia, and misogyny, not just at the hands of the police, but in general, the, the rate for how many black trans women make it past the age of 25 is alarming. It's, it's, True, like I, I can't even wrap my mind around it because it, it's basically like one in four black trans women make it past the age of 25. That's insane. And like that is, that's not a normal number. And I think, I think um, that this country needs to be equally as upset with the death of black women, with the death of black LGBT people, because they matter too. Breonna Taylor was shot eight times in her sleep. We are the same age. We're from the same city. We have mutual friends. And I can't help but think about how easily that could have been me. And I can't help but think that people aren't mad enough for her. Mm -hmm. You know, like we, it wasn't, she died in March and it's now June. And we have to piggyback off of George Floyd to bring her up. There's never been a protest of the death of a black woman. There's, this reaction is never given when it's the death of a black woman or the death of a black LGBT member. And we're just as important. And you should be just as enraged. And you should want change just as much for those people. Corinne Gaines was a woman who was shot in her home by a police officer. And people stopped supporting her because she fought back even though she was completely in the right because it was painted that she was an angry black militant woman. People then decided that maybe her death was justified, even though she was a targeted victim of police brutality and was killed in front of her child. So I just think like when you're hearing these stories, just know that these are the stories that people have deemed 
those people were unworthy of dying. That's just the tip of the iceberg. There are hundreds of stories of people who died same horrible deaths, but their story maybe not didn't fit the narrative quite as much. And I think like it, it, it would make you realize that this happens a lot more than we're, we're perceived. Um, not to like, one of the interesting things for me, it, it, it seems like a big part of this was Amy Cooper's video, <laughs> but, but in, in a large sense, it kind of has diminished. And I, I want to get from your perspective, because I think if ever there was a mirror, this would be it. Mm -hmm. um, simply because, you know, I, I think Trevor Noah, uh, he, had, he did this great video and, and he talked about it like, you always talk about like, oh, people know um, they can weaponize the police. But this, this wasn't an idea. This was point blank evidence of that. And, um, and I don't, you know what I mean? I, 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 I don't, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I think it, it's one of those things like so much is happening and it's not like I'm saying like think one over the other, you know, and especially like we go down the, the list of like everyone, you know, someone was saying like uh, uh, to, you know, there's, there's been 601 deaths since I forget the exact like timeline, but I'm like, that's, th those are the ones we know of. Yeah. You know, like. And those are the ones that escalated to that point and to jump off your point about Amy Cooper Amy Cooper wanted to happen to Christian Cooper, what happened to George Floyd. She called being perfectly content that that was a possibility. And we need to stop calling these women Karens and, and the, the male equivalents, the Chads or whatever, because you're taking away the point that this is white supremacy working in real time. By giving it a fun little name, you're sugarcoating what it really is. Yeah. And, I'm and oh, go ahead. Sorry, no, I, I just, uh, uh, like, I'm just very curious, like, how do you, how do we, um, how do we make people see that that is a mirror? Because, like, I, I guess that was my ultimate point of it. It's like, if you don't get it at this point, what, what, what where are you looking at? Yeah. You know, like, how, how, I don't, and I, that, that's, might be, like, the unanswerable question of this, but I don't know, how, how, how? I wish I knew, um, the Amy Cooper situation to me, uh, that's a normal Thursday. You know, like that every single black friend I have or black person I know, including myself, has an Amy Cooper story. I, I've told a couple people, um, when I first moved to Burbank and was moving into my apartment, I had the cops called on me because it was assumed that um, I didn't belong in this neighborhood and that I was breaking into an apartment. When I first bought my car, which is a BMW, I got immediately pulled over because the cop assumed that it wasn't my car. Yeah. You know, I, I have a great job and I make good money and I'm, you know, college educated and an X, Y, and Z. And I want people to understand that it's not a matter of us presenting ourselves a certain way or anything like that. Like this is, this is, people are aware at this point in time, people are fully aware of the damage that the police have done towards the black community. And actively watching police, the black community, you know that this is a possibility. You know that what could come about it. And you're telling us that you would rather that happen to us than you have a slight inconvenience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, uh, I, I truly appreciate it. Um, I have to unfortunately jump off because of uh, other other stuff that um, that I have to do. But um, but I sincerely appreciate um, you sharing this. And I know it it, it even feels so fucked up to like ha have had to ask. You know what I mean? Because it goes back to the idea of like, oh, we're looking to our our our, our black friends to educate us. And it's like, uh, yeah, they, they agree. Um, but um, where can um, for, uh, where can people, you know, follow you and, um, hey, stop, stop. Um, where can people follow you and, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, follow you, but also what do you want them to look for in terms of, you know, what, it's, I don't know, the, the, the account that they should follow where they can actually take action and so forth. For sure. Um, if you guys want to follow my own uh, personal account, I post a lot of resources um, as well as, like, 
um, members of various communities who can help you take part in the fight in uh, various cities. Uh, all of my social media is okay, Drew J. Um, that's O K D R E W J. Um, but some really great uh, podcasts that I think you guys can check out to really benefit. Um, if you are looking for, if you're a Christian and or a, a person of faith, and you're looking for some understanding um, and how to perceive all of this, especially if you are um, a white ally, I recommend uh, Existential uh, with Corey Leak. He was my worship pastor in college. He is. Phenomenal. He actually just put a story about raising children in an anti-black world um, for both white parents and uh, parents of color. And I put that in my story so you guys can check that out. And I think if you want more accounts of, um, you know, more personal experience stories, more understanding, more people sharing their heart, um, there's an amazing podcast called Queens Uncut, and they tackle so many issues because obviously this is such a multi-layered situation um and they tackle so many different issues and and it's and it's comical but it's also educational um so check both of those out they're both on my story um but thank you for having me thank you for letting me share please it was it was honestly the least that i could do in, in all of this so i i appreciate it and um yeah we'll touch base offline about your brother and things like that and you know you have me and um yeah um sure. thank you Thank you.